Hi everyone, I'm Katie in Chambers and welcome to Beneath the Surface. All you need to get the most out of this program is an open and inquisitive mind. Let's dive beneath the surface for a deeper look at this week's topic, stress, COVID-19 and coping with clinical psychologist, Dr. Aubrey Franklin. Dr. Franklin, thank you so much for joining us. I know this topic is dear to you, so let's dive into it. First, I want to start off by thanking you for allowing me to be on your platform. Uh, this is an amazing platform. Uh, anybody is would be an extremely wise person to watch these, uh, these uh, scenes and also make sure that they absorb all that information because if it doesn't apply to you now, it may apply to you in the future. I wanted to start by sharing some uh, information, some background mm -hmm. as it relates to um, COVID-19. We're going to start with looking at deaths worldwide, just setting the tone for what's happening with COVID-19. So as at May 27, 2020, more than 350,423 people have died from COVID-19. And I stress people simply because for the most part, we just keep hearing numbers, 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 numbers. The death count is, the death toll is, but in too many instances, the link isn't made, you know, concretely that to reiterate and reinforce that we're talking about people. We're not talking about rocks on the, on, on the river bank or the sand on the sea. We're talking about people. But what I want to also highlight is the economic impact worldwide. So according to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, over the next two years, COVID-19 will cost the global economy over seven trillion US dollars. Wow. This pandemic is said to be the worst economic shock the world has experienced since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Mm. The IMF has also forecasted that most major economies will lose at least 3% of their gross domestic product wow. because of COVID-19. People have lost their jobs. Some have reduced hours or wages. And then people are experiencing financial ruin because of those things. Yes, people are at risk of losing their housing, losing their cars, which is a way of getting around, yes? And, you know, some people have lost um, their medical, their healthcare plans. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, the impact has been so far reaching. It's not a hurricane that comes and uh, causes severe damage over a day, a few hours and then leaves you in ruin but hours later you're you're literally able to go go outside and start figuring okay so the roof is gone or the place is flattened where do i begin you know agencies can start moving in to assist you and so whatever natural disaster this it's not like that we are still in this and this is months later and then in our quick chat before something that you've highlighted that i know is important to you is the fact that the poor and vulnerable populations are those groups of people who are disproportionately impacted yes. by a situation such as this. All of this is definitely stress inducing. Yes, indeed. So, so with that said, I would say the best way to start is with ourselves and to start to catalog and sift out two things, things that we're in control of, and things that they were not in control of. Because what you'll find is that the things that we're not in control of, if we try to control us, if, well, if we try to control that, that is what stress is. Stress oh. is trying to control uncontrollable things. And the best thing that does happen is for us to take a pause, regather ourselves, assess what we can control, concentrate on that, and actually don't concentrate on the things that are outside of our control, that what is stressful for one is not stressful for, for others, it's our perception towards it. Yes. That, by, that is what we can control, our perception towards the challenge. Let's talk about the psychological impact or effects that physical isolation um, can have on mental health and subjective well-being. Absolutely. Well, the idea of social isolation, physical social isolation, in essence, 
is that once again, human beings are not built to be socially isolated. You know, in fact, one of the phobias that are generalized to most human beings is being trapped on a deserted island by yourself or being in the middle of an ocean where, you know, we even have mm -hmm. to wear it up the creek without a paddle. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, what we're saying in those phrases and statements is that we don't have the coping resources available to us to have it. One, one of the uh, coping resources and one of the most important ones that I think a lot of people take for granted is social support. That yes. now, social support is going to have to decrease when it comes to physical social isolation. Uh, from personal disclosure, uh, even though uh, I had two individuals in my family who passed away during this time, not necessarily of COVID, but they yes. did pass away nonetheless and we could not go to their funerals. Their yes. funerals, that physical social isolation, it was just a group of five people. Things have really changed. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they had to uh, uh, record the funeral. And then the thing about that is, is who's gonna watch a recorded funeral and be honest with you? And, uh, uh, and, and also you need that social support and, and that you should give to your family members that we could not give. So social isolation, if we were to translate the word physical social isolation into lack of social support, then I think that would make more sense to people on how important uh, uh, physical social isolation can negatively impact uh, our normal stress levels. Now, talking about typical adaptive or problem-solving capabilities that have been, that are typically compromised after a disaster, what is it is are you saying then that it is usual that it's our coping mechanisms after disasters are usually not as effective or it takes more to cope well yes because uh when you're looking at stressful events they kind of fall into three categories first you have like the daily hassles right like oh my goodness i'm stuck in traffic uh, oh, I'm late, I'm five minutes late, oh my God. <laughs> Daily hassles that honestly are just general perception of coping strategies built into us and take care of. Then you have the next level up, which is um, major, major life events. This is a loss of a loved one. This is moving to a whole new city, changing jobs. These are things that require just that much more level of coping strategy. Now, the higher tier is cataclysmic events. Now, this is what COVID-19 falls under. 9-11. Uh, 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 I remember when I was younger, uh, it was the space shuttle uh, explosion. Uh, I, I remember being, I think, in like the second or third grade, and, and our teacher stops uh, the lesson, and she rolls in that old dinosaur TV, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and says, oh my goodness, we, uh, this is what has happened. And in essence, she doesn't know what to say. And we as five or six year olds don't know what to say mm -hmm. either. We don't even know what's going on. So uh, these, these usual adaptive problem solving capabilities are meant to deal with the lower two uh, levels daily hassles and perhaps major life events but cataclysmic events are on a whole nother level and we may can't use those same usual adaptive problem solving capabilities with disasters what has to happen is that we have to combine all of our problem solving and adaptive capabilities together. But then what happens in this pandemic is that added ingredient <laughs> of physical social isolation. Think, yes. Let's just entertain our minds for a second and think, okay, we got the pandemic, COVID-19, but we don't have to social, social isolate. It would be just like uh, uh, SARS or uh, Ebola. Those things happened in the recent past, but because they, we didn't have to necessarily physically isolate in one ear and out the other, you know, and it came and went. 
uh, what are some others? Like? And I think probably also as it relates to Ebola because it was still primarily contained to one continent, one place. Exactly. You know, it was global like right. this also. Mm -hmm. Right. So therefore, this is real on, on, on a totally different level when it's a disaster. In fact, that's why it's called a pandemic because it yes. is something that is global. An epidemic, yes. like I'm saying, would just be localized to one particular area. Yes. But this is global, everywhere you go. Now we can talk about the importance then of mental health professionals right now, especially at this time. Now in general, we're both in the field, you're practicing, it's critical. And for me who have studied psychology, I understand the importance of it. But we need to highlight to the public, to our viewers, how important it is and why. Um, because there is still so much stigma associated with mental health and seeking help. It's far too, it, it, it's still far too prevalent that that is the case, you know. So we can talk about crisis counseling, but I also want to talk about, want you to, to, to reiterate or highlight why it is important to take care of our mental health and to see it the way, you know, we, we see our physical health. I would say for us to start to think of mental health counseling like it's like seeing your primary care physician. In fact, it is very similar. What, what is crisis, crisis counseling? Well, crisis counseling, uh, first is strength-based, uh, meaning that as you go through this particular type of counseling, you're going to get stronger in many different areas. Um, I would also say that it's anonymous and, and anonymity goes a long way when it comes to counseling. Kind of what we were talking about with the stigma. Uh, when things are held com in competence and confidentiality, uh, what that does is that establishes a trust system between the crisis counselor and the individual who is dealing with a particular crisis. Uh, without that anonymity, uh, really what you're dealing with is somebody who may vacillate between trust and mistrust. And as long as that vacillation exists, it's going to be very hard to uh, build a foundation uh, on which to, uh, you know, to continue to build off of. Uh, it's also outreach oriented. Uh, and what we mean by outreach oriented is that, I always tell my students this, it, it, the best thing to do is to just stretch out your hand as far as you can. If you go too far, then you're going to enable the individual. If you go too small, mm -hmm. you're going to disable the individual. It has to be met. The intensity has to be met together. Uh, and then, in essence, crisis counseling is just really helping impacted individuals and their families do one major thing regain control. Now, regaining control is a great phrase. Number one, it tells us that control was present at one particular point in time. It's not that it yeah. never was. So you can only regain something that you already gained. <laughs> so, uh, so regaining control is very therapeutic in itself to let us understand that we had it once. Let's just get it again. So when, it, uh, cri when crises happen, uh, crises kind of just shake us off. It's like, uh, it's, it's almost like, a, a ride. I've never done this, but uh, riding a uh, skateboard and then you fall off the skateboard. You, you, you can get back on. <laughs> it's, it's not like you can never get back on. It's like, oh man, I got off the skateboard, man. I'm never gonna be able to get back. <laughs> uh, if we were to look at the crisis as being temporary, and all it is is just a bridge between control and regaining control. Then we can have something to look forward to. We're gonna have a foundation to look back on. And now we're just going through this forest that we know there's an opening down the way. Um, it also ensures safety. It promotes return to functioning, normal functioning, as well as being informed about immediately available resources. See what, like you were saying earlier, is the fact that when you don't know, if, when that knowledge is not there, then it, it, it gives way to a crisis of one particular way. Now, because some people look at crises, they people look at crises in different ways. Some people could be, you could be in a mental crisis, you could be in an emotional crisis, 
You could be in a physical crisis where where you're, mm-hmm. you could be, where like a burning building or something like that. Mm-hmm. And and honestly, you could be in all types, all these three types of crises at one particular point in time. Okay. So mm-hmm. when you know what resources you have available, when you know, oh, okay, the uh, fire extinguisher is over there, then you have more of a uh, control over what Mm -hmm. you can do because you're like, I know where the fire extinguisher is and the fire extinguisher can help me uh, uh, put this fire out. Let us say a viewer is watching and and they really want to say, okay, I think I can benefit from crisis counseling. Are these like the 211 number in the US or the 1888 One Love number in Jamaica and you know, like numbers like that, that each country would have? Is that it? Is that how we would access it or is it, um, or does this reflect going into a particular organization that would offer this service? Because when you say it as an outreach, how, how does somebody access this? Well, there's many ways you can access it. I would suggest that you access it both uh, initially by uh, obtaining, doing your own research on it. I mean, the internet mm-hmm. is an awesome thing. Uh, the library is, still exists. <laughs> And we could go to these places and kind of read up on what crisis counseling is. And, and this is going to help us if we do start after the, if the second step is calling 211 or what have you, uh, which are great. Those, those individuals, those calls, those callers, I mean, uh, responders, they are perfectly trained in grief mm-hmm. counsel, crisis counseling. Uh, I, I know as a, as a uh, resident, uh, when I was getting my PhD, I was in suicide prevention and crisis counseling. Okay. So uh, we went through we went through extensive amounts of training uh, to the point we went through different scenarios, role play scenarios, everything mm-hmm. under the sun uh, to help us deal with. And we also it's a team that's involved. It's, even though you may be talking to one person, that individual is also getting support from their supervisors, other people involved. We talk about it, we self-disclose, so therefore we can get better, and it's kind of like a tend and be friend thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. so you can do that. Um, you could also uh, search the internet for referrals for different crisis counselors. Um, but I would say uh, initially, find out whether what you're dealing with is considered a crisis or not. And the way to do that is, because the thing about it is, it's got to, to use that analogy of the burning uh, house on fire, uh, would we consider a house on fire if our, uh, if you know, just something we were cooking on the stove start burning? I don't think we would, but, mm-hmm. if, but, but so when does it become a crisis? And I think, the best thing for us to do is to recognize when it became a crisis, when we transitioned over from non-crisis to crisis, and then that if that data, that information, now given to a crisis counselor, can really affect a better change as opposed to like, uh, I need to call somebody, just just anybody right now, and then you don't even you, you like like you know like even when the uh, 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 like think of like a firefighter that's coming to rescue. You. You gotta, you gotta want to be rescued, <laughs> you know. There's the <laughs> where they're like, "Come on, come on out, come on out, go, like, oh, yeah, little one, jump, jump!" Right? That, that, that's the hard part. Uh, so, uh, so just because you have, just because you have a responder there in a face of, in the form of a crisis counselor, doesn't necessarily mean that the crisis is going to be alleviated. I think it's best if you first realize that this crisis can be alleviated. Know, uh, know as much as you can initially about your own crisis and then give that to the person. It's like, it's like calling 911, right? They say, hello, 911, what's your emergency? And they say, you're like, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, where are you? Uh, I don't know that either. And it's like, uh, well, well, what are you experiencing? Ah, uh, click, right? Uh, and, and so then I'll that person can help you. You need, you need to know as much information predominantly as you possibly can. Dr. Franklin, I want us to, to look at psychological skills for coping. You gave me a list oh. and um, some very interesting terms. And, and so let's look at them now. I know you mentioned, so you mentioned resilience before, but let's talk about it again. Like, you know, 
let's let's help our viewers understand so these are psychological skills that when you put them in practice they can help you cope with stress and we all need that now as we're dealing with COVID-19. Buckle up because we got, we are rich with psychological skills and resources. Awesome. We, we got a trillion dollars worth of psychological <laughs> skills. So we, we got we got money to spare. We got psychological skills right. to just throw away. Uh, so oh, let me get okay. you excited. Now when it comes to resilience, this is the definition of resilience. The capacity to recover from difficult life events. Yes, it was difficult. Oh, what happened to you when you were five? Oh, nobody would want to go with that. Oh, what happened when you were 16? Ah, oh, yeah, oh, yes, that person died. Extremely difficult. We can recover. The name of the game is resilience. Number one, self-awareness. All that means is, who are you? Who, who are you? Not, not necessarily just, well, my name is so-and-so. That doesn't really tell you mm -hmm. And somebody else has named that too. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but the thing about self-awareness is, is a deep dive into asking yourself questions on who you are. And it's to start with that simple question. Who am I? You know, uh, what do I like to do? What do I not like to do? Uh, uh, what, what, what type of situations would I prefer to be in? What type of situations would I not prefer to be in? Questions like that, where, and, and to be very honest with you, start small, five minutes a day. Just ask yourself, who am I? If, you, if the first day you don't have an answer, ask yourself again. Don't give up because mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yourself knows who you are. And sometimes they, yourself can be very shy. You know, we have three selves, so to speak, in psychology. We have our ideal self, which is like, yeah, I want to be a superhero. We have our actual self, which is, oh my God, I miss who I look in the mirror every day. And then we have our art self, which is that gap between our ideal and our actual self, which says, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm eating this cake, but I should be eating fruits and vegetables, you know? <laughs> so self-awareness, when it comes to resilience. Why? Because a lot of people, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a uh, you know, in an in a abusive household, but hey, that's just how it is. No, that's not how it is. <laughs> that's not normal, you know? And it's okay that you went through that, but you have to be self-aware that it was a difficult situation. So it's honestly, to be, to be very honest with you, self-awareness is being honest with you. Number two, attention, flexibility and stability of focus. So that means that what are you paying attention to? Start to catalog what you're paying attention to. Do you see no one be paying attention to the negative stuff that's out there? You know, uh, do you only, if somebody says, hey man, it's a great day out there, and your response is, well, yeah, but it's gonna rain later on today. What are you paying attention to? Because in earnest, what you're paying attention to is what you're going to visualize and see, and that's your life, yes. right? If somebody is paying attention, look, you can be, you can be in a, I remember when I was in New York City in graduate school and I was in my apartment and it was gloomy days. I wasn't used to, you know, uh, the snow and low light levels. Uh, I even slightly uh, dealt with seasonal affective disorder because I came from Houston, okay. Texas, where there was a lot of sunlight. Sun. Yeah, and so I remember looking at pictures of home. I remember looking at pictures of uh, nice getaway destinations. And truthfully, what I paid attention to more as, as opposed to the gloomy day that was outside my window, my emotions start to get more positive. My outlook on life starts to get more positive. So what we pay attention to, our directed attention, helps mobilize our effort to get to what we're paying attention to. So if we're paying more attention to the gloomy days, then we're going to only get gloomy days. Uh, now, here's another one. It's a two-parter. Uh, letting go, <laughs> and I'll repeat it again, letting go. And now some people are like, oh, no, I don't want to let it go. Okay, so let me ask you this, uh, hold on to it. 
<laughs> right? Now, I'm sure you're probably now, well, but if I hold on to it, then it's going to just keep doing the same. Right on. That's absolutely right. So I know letting go is hard, but letting go can go in steps, right? First, take your index finger off. <laughs> <laughs> then your other finger, then all your other fingers until you have fully let go. Every time you let go a little bit, catalog how good you feel. Yeah. Now, letting go happens in two ways. You got to let go physically, like I was saying. Let go if somebody got your hand, you know, if somebody shake your hand too, too long, you're like, hey, man, let my hand go, right? But then they can let your hand go physically but they may not let your hand go mentally. And what I mean is that even though they're shaking your hand physically, and let's say they stop physically shaking your hand, they can just hang around you all the time, right? And, and now you're like, oh man, this person's in my space, right? You know, uh, I remember, you know, if you have a younger brother or an older sibling, you know, it's kind of like that person, like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you right? And it's like, and then, you tell your parents like, "Hey, mom, he's he's, he's how do you even even explain it? <laughs> mom, he's over here not touching. He's following me around. <laughs> so letting go has to be twofold. Just because you let go physically is only half the battle. You must let go mentally. And what I would suggest is to let go mentally first, and then the physical manifestation of letting go will happen all by itself." So letting go mentally, let's help, literally means it's no longer running through your mind over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it takes work to do that. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know? Oh, yes. It takes, it's just like working out, just like you. If you want to get ripped and have big biceps, you don't get bi big biceps after just one workout. You got to incorporate that into your lifestyle. Letting go should mm -hmm. be your lifestyle. It's like, hey, yes. that, that person cut me off in the uh, in traffic. Oh yeah, but I but I'm the guy who yeah. lets it go. So so I'm all yes. because yeah. and, uh, and 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 here's the big thing that I want to uh, make sure that I iterate to everybody. Sometimes pe people consider letting go as a weakness. That is not a weakness. In fact, holding on is a weakness, right? Think about yes. when you're scared. Uh, and you're watching a scary movie and your your boo, your bae is right next to you, right? Don't you, oh my God, I'm scared, right? You hold on to the person. Isn't that weakness, right? So, so holding <laughs> on is, 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 letting go is actually, because <sighs> letting go okay. is autonomous. I don't need to use this as a blanket anymore because I can do it. I got it. Yes. And the last, the last key step is assessing and sustaining positive emotion. Now I say assessing and sustaining in two folds because you may just say, oh, you know what, I'm happy today. But you need to hold on to that happiness. That, that's something you can't hold on to, is, ha is a positive emotion and sustain it. It's, it's like, um, uh, and then what comes to my mind is, you know, uh, and I know a lot of people don't think about this all the time, but let's say you, uh, you're driving your car and you come up to a red light. Now, you slowly take your foot off the gas and then you start to press the uh, brake pedal until you come to a stop and you must hold that position until the light turns green. So first you have to access the pedal, brake pedal. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sustain. Now you can just, think if you just access and you just press the brake lightly once, Ooh. you're gonna keep going, right? <laughs> so the same thing when it comes to positive emotion, you must access it and then also sustain it. Keep your foot mm -hmm. on the pedal when it comes to positive emotion. And that's, that. now it is hard to do. Right? But just like you learn how to do it when you drive, uh, driving a car, you can do it when it comes to positive emotions. Well, we're going to pause here for today because, and I'm going to invite you back another day for us to talk, um, have a, probably a part two 
about this kind of um, management of stress. So is there any last thoughts? Are there any last thoughts that you have that you'd like to share with our viewers, Dr. Franklin? Yes, uh, I, I want to encourage everyone out there, all the viewers there, stress is controllable. It is manageable. It, uh, it takes, it takes just like anything, it takes a skill uh, and it takes a skill set. And we all are capable of obtaining these skill sets. Um, just because we don't see a way now doesn't mean there is no way. Uh, we just have to open our minds to these things. Our perception is very strong, like we said earlier. Our thoughts are powerful. So as we watch our thoughts, we create our own reality. And to me, that is, uh, from everything that we talked about, that is the biggest caveat to take away from this, is that our thoughts, we just don't know how powerful our thoughts are. We've only scratched the surface of that. And if we will continue to keep scratching that surface, we're gonna come up with some amazing facts, amazing life-changing ideas, and we're really going to live the life that we always want. In fact, live the life that we never imagined, because that's the real essence of it. If we can imagine it, of course we can have it. But we're talking about the unimaginable things that are yeah. positive. So uh, it's, I, I want to thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. Yes, I'll be back for your part two, part three, part 20. Whatever it is, yes. I, I'll be here for it because this is a passion of mine. And, uh, you know, uh, from my own personal experience, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've triumphed over stress. And I know that if I can do it, then other people can do it as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Franklin. That's it for this week's show. Thank you for joining us on Beneath the Surface for our discussion with Dr. Franklin on stress, COVID-19, and coping. Please join us next week for another thought-provoking discussion. Tell your family and friends to join us next Saturday. And remember that you have the ability to cope with the stresses that may have resulted from COVID-19 or from any other source. However, if you feel like you need some help, please contact your local support agencies. We have also listed some on screen and you can check our website, theirproductions.com and our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram pages at theirproductions1. for watching Beneath the Surface. Remember to subscribe, like, and share with your friends and family. I am Katie Chambers, and that's it for this week's show. Thank you.